Hello, everyone. This is what your pastor didn't tell you. Today, I am on with Dr. Joel Correcto, the, the biblical scholar that challenged James White. No, uh, but today we are talking about Romans 9. Um, no, the, <laughs> um, but yeah, Romans 9, uh, wh what does it say? Wh does it teach some type of uh, Calvinist interpretation or is it something very different? Dr. Joel had a a video going uh, verse by verse that talked about that on his channel. Everybody go check that out. But today we're going to go into a little bit more detail on that, answer some other questions. Not all talked about that. This will be like a part two to that video. How are you doing today, Dr. Joel? Yeah, I'm really good. Thanks, Zach. Uh, yeah, it's a nice, nice morning here in British Columbia, Canada. Beautiful sunshine outside. Yet here I am inside this room. Oh, what a life. <laughs> It is a it's a good life being a, a biblical scholar. All right, yeah, so I have a, uh, just in case it accidentally happens later and I don't realize it, I have my pretentious mug. So mm -hmm. um, this mug has a Ph. It says PhD on it. Please don't think that I've like brought this for this like to to be that guy. This is my wife bought this for me, and <laughs> so if it turns and I'm drinking coffee and you go, oh wow, look at that guy. Just just know this is just the mug we use. <laughs> All PhD scholars use that mug. Yes. Oh, you you do get one. Yeah, you get one as soon as you get a PhD. Yeah, they send it to you. They. <laughs> yes, they. <laughs> okay. All right. We got a uh, film score life. What's up, guys? Hello, film score life. All right. So let's talk about this. We're talking about Romans nine. Uh, so you obviously, as I said, you made a video on it. Um, before we get into that, I just wanted to mention that whatever Joel says today, um. Pretty much all of it, if not all of it, is not actually going to contradict with uh, just Calvinism as a whole. So you can like be a Calvinist and still hold all of the positions that Joel has on Romans nine. Uh, so you can you can still hold the position and and draw that from other texts. So this really is a conversation about just what Romans nine says. We're all coming together. We're just having a conversation, trying to figure out what Romans nine says. And Joel is going to give his reasons why he takes a specific interpretation on that. Uh, but Joel, could you tell us your just your your general views on Romans nine? What's going on in the text? What is your main reasons to come to your conclusion? Um, that might differ than maybe like a Calvinist reading on the text? Yeah, yeah, thanks, Zach. So, yeah, I think I need to, to highlight again what you said there, which is that we, you can hold what I'm going to say, like this this interpretation, and still have a, a Calvinistic system. You can still be kind of predeterminist. You can have that view of God's sovereignty if you want to um, for other reasons, but like we're talking specifically about this text. So I'm going to be focused on on this text. And yeah, so I can I can give you a brief kind of overview uh, of what of, of how I how I see this. I won't go as in depth as the video that you referred to. If you do want to kind of see me go word by word, verse by verse, very carefully, please check out that video. But yeah, when it comes to to, to this verse um, or this chapter, I should say, uh, it's a pretty big one in Calvinistic interpretation a lot of the time. Uh, I could start maybe with a basic kind of Calvinistic overview of how you would. How, Generally speaking, there's a lot of different interpretations. So I'll back up one more time. There are a lot of different ways that people read Romans 9. I'm giving you a take. There are many takes. There are many, many different ways that people see this. It's a very complex passage. Okay, so just let's let's clear the air there. And nobody has the the ultimate authority here. No one is, yeah, there's, it, it's it's a difficult passage. And everyone, I, well, scholars recognize that for sure. Um, <laughs> anyways, uh, so the Calvinistic, typical Calvinistic reading, it's often said that Romans nine is going to be about God's sovereign choice and who's saved. So the passage starts out, it's after this kind of awesome, uh, chapter eight, where Paul is kind of giving the new covenant, uh, blessings, the new covenant reality of the spirit. And then he says, okay, well then some of my, my Jewish kinsmen are not believing. And then he, he's asking the question, why, what's going on with them? He's, he's troubled by that. And he goes on to explain why. And he says that uh, not all who are from Israel are Israel. That's kind of this line he uses. And that, and typically in the, in the Calvinistic view, it's saying that um, well, not all are Israel, uh, not all from Israel are Israel means that uh, true Israel is like elect Israel, the elect remnant or something like that. Those who are predestined to be saved. And so typically these interpretations, um, they'll, they'll kind of go from there. Um, I don't often see people deal with Genesis, the citations of Genesis 21 
and uh, 18. Um, if, if people are wondering, um, maybe I'm jumping ahead here a bit, what, what exactly, what verses we're referring to, I'll just read you really quickly. So in Romans 9, verse 6, but it's not as though the word of God has failed, for not all those who are from Israel are Israel, nor are they all children because they are descendants of Abraham, but in Isaac will your descendants be named. That is, it's not the children um, of the flesh who are children of God, but the children of promise who are counted as descendants. Uh, for the statement of the promise is this, at this time I will return and Sarah will have a son. And so those are verses 6 to 9, and you've got two citations there uh, from Genesis 21 and Genesis 18. And those are often kind of, I, I find them, they're glossed over a lot, but then he goes on and says, and not only this, but when Rebecca conceived by one man, Isaac, our father, although they had not yet been born or done anything good or evil, in order that the purpose of God, according to election, might remain, not by works, but by the one who calls, it was said to her, the older will serve the younger, just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. Yeah, thanks for putting those up there. And so you, you oftentimes you'll go, okay, uh, true Israel, elect Israel, and then it goes to this talk, this passage about Jacob, that the, they claim the passage is talking about God choosing Jacob for salvation apart from anything he did. Um, from this line of interpretation, the questions um, Paul asks, following like, is there any unrighteousness on God's part? Or why does God still find fault for who can resist his will? Uh, these questions, uh, they presuppose are someone posing the question about God's uh, right or prerogative to predestine and elect individuals to salvation or damnation. So um, he has mercy on whom he has mercy. He hardens whom he hardens. That is, he can um, save somebody um, and individually um, predestine them, or he can harden them, make them a vessel of wrath, someone he's going to damn, and that's his choice. And that's what the passage is then thought to be talking about. Um, that's kind of like the gist of the, the interpretation. I'm very generally speaking. Um, and so just kind of, I, I imagine some people who are watching this hold some sort of view like that um, with the different parts maybe being connected a little bit differently in certain ways, shapes and forms. Um, but that's the, that's the general gist. And so I don't think that that's what this passage is getting at. So I'll just briefly kind of go over what, what I think it is getting at. I think both interpretations are starting with the same question. So Paul's question is why are his kinsmen, like the Jewish folks, not believing in their Messiah at the time? Um, but I think the Calvinistic line of reasoning, it's going to make some wrong turns uh, after that question. So one of the main things in this text is that Paul is going to frequently refer to biological offspring. So he's going to be talking about his kinsmen according to the flesh, the biological descendants of Jacob or of, of Israel. And so when he says that not all are from Israel are Israel, he's making the specific point that coming from Israelite descent, coming from the lineage, is not the main criteria for defining Israel. It's it's not just about lineage. And so at the time, if you're um, if you're in the first century, there seems to be kind of a um, kind of resting on your, the laurels of being an Israelite or being of of, of the lineage of uh, Jacob. The, pe the people were. Uh, assuming that that um, that gave you a good status or some some greater status um, with, with with God or being right in the covenant just by virtue of being um, Jewish or of that descent, and he's going he's going to go no that's actually not the case here it's not just about lineage, um, God but the point of view that God has always sovereignly chosen how to define Israel and that he's actually going to get into that here so being from Israel doesn't make you Israel. Uh, that's that's the point uh, that it's it's more it's God's choice in how Israel is defined. So what defines Israel? And he's going to now do an argument. He's going to give you an argument for how that works. Hmm. He introduces a particular uh, term here that uh, is not always apparent in English translations, but he uses the term sperma, which is seed. So if you look to verse seven, maybe you could throw it up. That would be helpful. Uh, in verse seven, he says that not all the children of, of Abraham are the seed of Abraham. And so what is the seed is the question. Uh, and so if you go into your Old Testament, yeah, thank you for throwing that up there. Uh, I think, yes, yeah, yeah that's good. Yeah, um, it says offspring there. Uh, yeah, not all are the, yeah, it's probably a little bit of a different translation, but that, that, that's that's fine. So one term is the, the tecna, the children, and there's the sperma. And so the sperma is this idea of the seed, zara in your Old Testament, and you're going to find it in Genesis and it refers to specifically uh, the, the line of promise. 
It's going to be the, the, the line through which God is going to continue the Abrahamic blessing. So in Genesis 12, we hear that, that God is, going, is working with Abraham and that through him, uh, he's going to uh, bless the whole world. In you, all the nations of the world will be blessed. And he's got this kind of plan with Abraham. And so that's going to continue. And he's, God is going to sovereignly choose which uh, line, which son uh, that, that will continue that. And that, then that um, blessing of Abraham, essentially, that, uh, that task to be, to be the blessing, the vehicle of blessing to the nations, that will go through certain lines. And so that's the seed. So he's going to compare that to biological children, um, which are he calls children of the flesh, or um, depending um, natural lineage or something, depending on which translation you have. And so the point here is that from the get-go, uh, God doesn't define Israel on the basis of biology or primogeniture or birth order. Um, he he defines Israel based on his choice. So he you have Isaac, and you have Ishmael. Ishmael is the, the older, so technically should have the inheritance, should be the one inheriting this blessing, this Abrahamic promise. But it doesn't go to, to Ishmael, it goes to Isaac. So it's God's choice, the son that God chooses. And so that's what's what's going on with this, with this idea of the sperma. Where does the blessing of Abraham go? And so that first text that he, he cites proves this. Uh, he, God chooses the second born of Abraham as the seed. Through Isaac shall your offspring be named. And it's through your seed. So the, also the word offspring there is the seed. And th that's really the point he's going to be making going forward is that God has always had the prerogative, the right to choose uh, how to define Israel. And it's not based on lineage um, solely, uh, but God can choose. Uh, so that what it doesn't mean, though, is that God chose Isaac to be individually predestined or saved. That's, that's not what the context of Genesis is referring to. The context refers to which group, like which family will continue this Abrahamic promise. Hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And so Ish, it, like, so for example, Ish, Isaac, it's pretty clear that Isaac, it's not, he's not being predestined to salvation individually because I mean, Ishmael isn't given a bad rap or anything like Ishmael uh, is actually treated quite well in the old Testament text. It's not talking about whether who is saved, who's who's not, or anything like that. It's just talking about where this people of promise, the people who are going to continue this revelation, continue this kind of re relationship that will then um, be a light to the nations, in essence. Uh, who's doing that? And the same holds for the next generation. So if you keep going, um, you've got in the text, you've got Jacob is, is the younger brother, and then you've got Esau is the older. And so Esau, again, should inherit and should be the one through whom God is working based on firstborn rights. But God says no by his own choice, before they were born, before they did anything, um, God says, I'm working with Jacob and Jacob's line. And so he is going to continue that Abrahamic promise, the seed promise through uh, through Jacob hmm. and not through Esau. And so when it, when it says that God chose Jacob before he had done anything good or evil, it isn't talking about, again, individual salvation. He's talking about the Old Testament context. It's which people group will be defined as Israel, Israel being this thing with where the Abrahamic promise is continuing. That's what God's choice, what's what that's what God's choice is. And this is really this is really important for Paul's argument because it explains why his kinsmen are not believing at the time. It's because God never based Israel, this this, this thing, the Abrahamic promise people, um, solely on birthright. Israel is it's not defined by lineage, but by by God. And now God has made the choice to put the promises of Abraham in Christ. And so he's saying not all who are biologically from Israel are Israel because Israel is defined by God and God is defining it now in Christ. And so this is the alleged injustice on God's part. If you throw that, maybe throw that verse up there when it says that uh, it's an injustice on God's part. Um, that's what's being responded to, that God has made this choice again to reconstitute, redefine Israel in, uh, in Christ. And then when it says, why does he still find fault for who can resist his will? It's referring to, and you could probably throw that verse up too, to a, either a, a first century Jew or a Judaizer who's claiming that it's it's unfair. This is what I think at least. So please, again, this is what I think. I know there are multiple ways to take this. It's a Jew or a Judaizer who's claiming that it's unfair that God has reconstituted his people in in Christ. Like they didn't have a say in that. Like how, how are they suddenly on the wrong side of things? Like he's chosen the seed to be in in Christ. And so now they're kind of de facto on the outside. 
So he's, Paul takes on the voice of someone who's saying that God is unjust for changing the ru- changing the rules, so to speak. Um, he's also going to get into this idea of hardening. Paul is. Uh, so Pharaoh is going to be mentioned. And uh, I think Pharaoh is kind of like a proxy for present day Jews. Uh, the implication that Paul is making is that uh, they're resisting God's choice in Christ and are being hardened now. So you're kind of supposed to think when you see Pharaoh, he's actually making the inference that it's referring to present day um, unbelieving uh, Jews. So they, those people have found themselves in the position of, of vessels of wrath. Um, God divided the lump of clay. Um, so later on, he'll talk about, uh, does not the potter have the right over the clay to make out of the same lump, one for honorable use, one for dishonorable use? And so the idea is that Israel, this lump, has been split. And now certain groups have found themselves in the position of opposing what God is doing because they're opposing Christ. They're in the wrong lump, so to speak. And they're saying, like, how is that fair? So Paul is, he's going to continue to show this in the passage. Um, and he's going to show that God has done done this in the past. He's going to cite Isaiah. I didn't get this to this in my video. So for those who are wondering, we will talk about this as well. That uh, he's going to cite Isaiah who talks about God reconstituting Israel based on the two southern tribes way back. That comes later. And so Paul is going to claim that God has done something similar in his day in Christ. So he did that back then. He made the seed. Israel, 12 tribes, now it's, nope, now it's just the bottom two is the people who are continuing this Abrahamic promise, and the other 10 are being, they're, they're out, as, as, in essence. So he's, he's continuing with these two, and then the inference as well, then, that now in Christ, he's done it again, he's made this, the, the, the remnant or the seed another smaller subsection, um, and so that's the argument going forward. Um, so it's not about individual predetermination to salvation or damnation. It's about how God can choose how he defines and constitutes Israel. Uh, how you get in that group is, is by faith in Christ. So uh, that's that, that's the, how, the in and out. Uh, Paul's kinsmen are not true Israel uh, in that sense. God has redefined Israel in Christ. The text is about how that seems unfair to some opponents of Paul and how Paul can justify that that claim of what's going on now in Jesus. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right, Does that so make sense? I, yeah, for sure. All right. So, I mean, certainly one of the biggest uh, verses here is talking about Jacob and Esau. And it, and it says, though they were not born yet. So before they were even born, God, like they haven't done anything good or bad yet. So it's not mm-hmm. based on whether they've done anything. Um, it's purely for God's purpose of election might continue. And then later it even talks about like, for God's glory. All right, we'll talk about that later. Uh, but it says, not because it works, because of him who calls. And then it says, the older will serve the younger, as in Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. So, like, it certainly makes sense why some people would, would interpret that to mean like, hey, before we're even born, you know, God chooses some people for election, some people, in other words, not. And, you know, that's that's just how it is. And, you know, this is just an explanation for that. Um, but like, you know, you, you really got, you got into it there, but like, what are the specific reasons? Like, why exactly do you not take a interpretation like that? Like, what are your main arguments for, for why you shouldn't take that interpretation as well as maybe other, I guess, uh, Calvinistic interpretations in this passage? Yeah, I mean, I did get a bit into it there, which is basically just saying that you have to look at what what is the context of the choosing? What is it referring to when it talks about election, when it talks about before they've done anything good or evil, what kind of, what is the choice that's being made? Is it, is he choosing Jacob to be individually saved mm-hmm. and Esau to be individually damned? Or if you go back to the old Testament context, you'll see actually, no, he's talking about people, the people group who will continue this seed mm-hmm. promise. That's what he's talking about. And so I think the biggest problem with like the this the calvinistic interpretation of this passage is that it's um the old testament references are going to lead you in a different way they're the best window into to getting into what paul is trying to communicate so his his language outside um of even the direct or indirect citations are influenced by old testament language as well so this is a, a old testament laden passage <clears throat> it's 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 all over the place it's really like a, a chapter on a commentary about how God deals with Israel, how he defines Israel, his right in choosing which part of the Abrahamic descendants he wants to work with and the parameters um, with which he wants to, ch- he chooses to work. 
So I think if you're going to say, oh, it's about individual Jacob Esau uh, before they've done anything good, good or bad, individual salvation, predetermined salvation, well, it's like, okay, then you're actually not looking at the Old Testament context at that point, and you're assuming that, that that's what Paul's talking about without trying to at least see what maybe these passages were talking about in their original context. Hmm. And so again, it's about the seed. It's about which people group will continue this Abrahamic promise. It's about actually nations. So if you go... If you look at the older will serve the younger passage that you just talked about, uh, the Old Testament context, the, the literally the next line in that very like that, that very verse is that there are two nations in your womb, two people groups in your womb. And so, uh, yeah, there you go. Thank you. Yeah, two nations are in your womb. Uh, sorry, the verse before. Yes, the two nations in your womb and the two peoples will be separated from within you. One people will be stronger than the other and the older will serve the younger. So in other words, Paul is citing a verse about people groups and that's the point is that which which group are we talking about here um which group is going to continue this abrahamic uh promise and so the choice is in that sense sovereign that god is sovereignly choosing i am working with jacob's line but he's not individually predestining people to salvation or damnation he's saying i choose to work with this line and that's my prerogative to do so i can do so I can choose which group I work with, and it doesn't. It isn't based on things like natural birthright or something like that, or primogeniture. Uh, God, God is sovereign in that in that sense of making His choice. Gotcha. Is there anything else you want to add? Any other arguments you had um, that make you come to that conclusion? Uh, I mean, without getting like really into the details, I mean, there, there's all sorts of stuff. Uh, you, like I was saying, you get uh, these kind of inter intertextual things going on, these kind of subtle citations as well. Paul's going to cite uh, in, in, in the passage about clay, like does the potter not have the right over the clay? He's mm -hmm. going to refer to Isaiah. And in those passages, if you go back to Isaiah, it's talking about Israel specifically questioning God's choice of redemption, how he chooses to redeem them. And... Uh, that's literally what's going on in the first century. That's the argument Paul is making that Israel has is not or his unbelieving Jewish kinsmen are questioning the way that God has done redemption. And so again, it's this idea of uh, Israel kicking against uh, Paul's uh, or God's choice to reconstitute Israel in Christ and them finding themselves on the outside of that. In my opinion. Okay. All righty. Uh, so. Uh, someone someone chimed in from the comments, and I want to to mention that. All right, so verse 15, um, in this translation at least, it says, For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So this is right after saying, Jacob, I loved, Esau, I hated, um, injustice with God. Certainly not, right? Um, yeah. So a lot of people would interpret that to say, hey, this is clearly about salvation. Like, certain people are are being saved those are the ones that god has mercy on and then those who do you know you know if god doesn't have mercy on you you, you know you, you're just not part of the that group um but do you think this is about a salvation or, or what do you think this is about you know i mean again go to the old testament context so we're dealing with uh, uh moses and god arguing about whether or not god will continue to work with the current group of israel um uh, and maintain this Abrahamic um, line promise, this moving to the promised land, this whole this whole plan, or is he going to remove all of them and start over with one person, Moses, and then continue it? Um, and so the point of the passage is that God is saying, I can choose, so yeah, I can choose however I want to to um, constitute this people. I can, can, I can have mercy in that I can keep going with them, or I could go just down to you Moses and I could work with you it's really up to, it's God's own prerogative how he um whether or not he decides to continue working with the people um or reconstitutes them uh and I think that that's what's going on there it's not talking about like one specific person I have mercy on you and I predetermine whether or not um you're saved or not like that it's just he can define the parameters of the relationship if he wants to continue to have mercy with the group and continue to work with them he can or he can choose not to. That's the, that's the original context of it, uh, which is actually quite apt in Paul's own day, because then you've got again. Um, he he has uh, he's come up against Israel, who are or unbelieving Jews, who are saying uh, 
like they're, they're kicking against it. And he said, you know what, I can choose to have mercy or I can choose not to. And he's chosen not to in that sense. He's now chosen to go in to, to move the promises into, into Christ, to move this whole Abrahamic blessing into Christ. And so, again, going to the original context is really important. Uh, even this this verse itself is in, in the original Hebrew. Um, it's the specific formula, like it's a, grammat- a syntactical formula called the idem per idem formula. And the idea, it's actually a really emphatic, God is can choose however he decides, like however he wants to have mercy, he can. So it's really up to him. I, I, can, ha- I can choose to maintain my relationship with this group, or I can choose not to. Um, that's, that's essentially what's going on. I see. Really interesting. Yeah. So that's actually a, a quote from Exodus 33 and 33, 19. So yeah, that, that's certainly, I mean, if you're going to in, interpret a, a verse to mean a specific way, now you could say, Hey, like maybe Paul is reading out of context, but um, you know, most likely if he is reading in context, then you really got to take that seriously. Right. And we'll talk about that. Like, you know, what is Paul doing, whether he's reading context, is he giving extra knowledge into the text from inspiration? We'll talk about that here. So, uh, so, uh, and we'll also get into other comments later here, maybe on that same topic. So let's, let's get into that here. What is the next question? Oh, yes. The other thing I want to mention is that I need more help with this outfit because it won't stay up and it keeps coming mm-hmm. down. So if someone knows about ancient outfit, Roman outfits that can help me keep this up, that would be really appreciated. I know yeah, and like I mean, you had that made pro- professionally by like a like a Renaissance fair person, right? Yes. It was like what three, three, four thousand dollars. Yes, yes. Surprisingly, my wife is trained in in ancient. Re- you said Renaissance. <laughs> Renaissance fair. I don't know. Like some people who would make those things, who make ancient outfits. Yeah. Well, I mean, even if it is re- ancient Renaissance, that's not that's not ancient Roman, right? So- no, I know it is. I just mean like what kind of people make outfits, uh, and people at Renaissance fairs make outfits. I don't know. Is there like an ancient Roman? uh equivalent i don't know i just just, i just chose the most modern equivalent i could think of (laughs) okay all righty um so i'm blaming you for my pausing here because all your stuff is in bold and i don't know which my questions okay here it is all right all right uh all right here you go so yeah many many of you have uh, uh, so one of the the big comments that you got in your your video on this topic was that you're like you know you're, you know, a Greek scholar, like you're coming to the text, like, you know, we, you, we have to, we have to use your Greek wisdom and, and linguistics. And it's, it's, it's fancy, like, you know, for a lot of people, like, that seems not right. Like, hey, we, we shouldn't need to need to know all this to understand the Bible that we don't need a Bible scholar to have knowledge about this specific text of Romans. They might even say that we should just take the plain meaning of Roman not Romans nine. And of course, you know what they would say is you know the plain meaning is this this calvinistic interpretation if you just take romans 9 by itself and just read it then then that's what you'll get so what are your thoughts on that yeah so i i respect the idea that people want to take the bible seriously they want to read it without some sort of tricks or something like that uh however i think that this kind of view is actually not not so much related to the bible than it is to like epistemology like th- this person uh, assumes that the knowledge they have, like the worldview that they have constructed, uh, the informa- that that information is sufficient to understand the worldview of someone from 2000 years ago. Like um, somehow they're just going to align your worldview and Paul's worldview are going to align the way you're talking and Paul talking. Like you're just going to come to the text and there it is. You're going to know what he's talking about. Um, it assumes that you're like working with the same data points, but this actually isn't how human knowledge works. Um, we can't just like walk up to the text and assume it shares our worldview. We have to try and get into the worldview of the text. You have to try and get out of your own way of thinking and get into somebody else's thinking. And the way we do this is through study, right? Uh, we can't do that by ourselves. We rely on communities. Uh, a good example uh, of this would be just, like, just if you, this is the way you think this, this, like you don't need anyone else. Uh, okay. We'll go grab your English Bible, open it up. Okay, what does it say? You start reading it, but then I'm going to stop you. I'm going to say, well, how did you get those English words? And you're going to go, oh, well, because it's a translation, the translation from the Hebrew and the Greek. I'm going to say, okay, but can you do that? Probably not. How did those scholars, how did those translators get there? Well, they had to rely on um, looking at ancient documents. They had to study other ancient contexts. They had to like do all sorts of things to get you your English Bible in front of you. 
-hmm. So to say that you don't rely on scholarship or on a community or on this team effort for understanding what the Bible says, um, that's just not, it's not, it's not real. Um, that's, fa that's a fabricated kind of view. Uh, we are, we're all working together. And so the plain meaning is not just there. Uh, you're relying on a translation. You're relying on a worldview. You're relying on uh, a lot of things really. And so it, you can't, it doesn't just work like that. We all, you, you can't assume your own context is going to match their context. Uh, and the, the task of study then is to remove your own presuppositions and to come to the text and see, okay, maybe I'm missing something. Maybe I'm not understanding how someone in the first century would be arguing, or there are other data points that I'm not picking up on. And that's how we reconstruct views. And that's how we uh, eventually get to a better reading, a closer understanding of the text. This is very much the the hermeneutical spiral if you go to like bible college you'll like you'll hear this like you're getting closer and closer and closer to the meaning of what an author was trying to get at mm. and so i think you have to consider these kinds of things mm. yeah that's really interesting okay so and another really uh popular comment on your video was this idea that hey like sure the the context of the old testament matters that is the old testament at the same time paul is an inspired writer so being inspired by god god could give him extra knowledge they many would argue of course that they that he did give them extra knowledge and that paul isn't necessarily reading you know he's not using these quotations to specifically say like hey this is exactly what the original like he's not doing some like uh commentary on romans he's in being inspired he's giving extra knowledge onto the text and that so that to to mention all these Old Testament passages and their specific meaning um, makes it seem like, hey, Paul, um, you know, can't can't do that. Like, like if, if Paul is giving extra meaning, then, you know, the, whatever the Old Testament means in that specific context doesn't really matter much that much anyways. Right. I mean, yeah, that's, that's a, that was some, a view that a lot of people or some people espoused. Um, there's a couple different ways to think about this. I think in one sense, it's a little bit of a, it's kind of backwards thinking. Uh, it's kind of implying that Paul doesn't know how to read the Old Testament. If you're saying, oh, he's just coming up with this new meaning, this non com completely removed meaning, his own thing. I mean, okay. Uh, but it's kind of a bit offensive to say that Paul couldn't understand his, his text, or maybe you say he does understand and he um, came up with something new or something like that. But um, we're, we're really just talking about the basic context of each passage that he's citing. It's not, he's not doing, I don't think he's doing kind of gymnastics here. Uh, and I'm all for the apostles doing interesting things with the old Testament. Uh, the question is, do they completely leave behind any semblance of the original context? And now there actually are people who say, yes, that, that is the case. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry. I'm still sick as you can probably tell. Um, yeah, I, uh, I give the apostles a bit more credit than that. Excuse me again. Sick some water. You know, it's really interesting sick because you, you, yeah, you, you started getting sick right as we were doing that, that video response to the debate with Leighton Flowers and James White. Yeah. That is a really it's interesting over coincidence. Weeks. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know what? There we go. Yeah, it's, it's, it must be like, it's judgment is what it is. <laughs> or, or Satan. Yeah. Oh. Oh yeah. Or, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So anyways, uh, uh, another, so that's like one thing is, okay. Is Paul just dismissing it? Can we not give him more credit? Um, but another way that I think this kind of idea is a bit off is that you're, you're kind of saying that you, that you, I think it's kind of saying that you have an understanding of Paul election predestination. And I think oftentimes this person is kind of saying they aren't interested in seeing, um, if that might not be what this passage is saying. You kind of go, you come into it with, you think this is what Paul's apostolic interpretation is. And then you kind of bring that to it before, without even allowing the text to possibly say something else. Like you assume it's Paul's special understanding of the Old Testament. And I think this approach veils like a lacking desire to explore what the text could mean in this, <clears throat> in like a, but by using this kind of magical non-see-through blanket that we call apostolic interpretation it's almost like a way of putting your head in the sand um and saying like oh, no, i think it's just it's, it's his special interpretation not what the old text of the context says and you've already predetermined what that 
uh, no pun intended, you've already uh, assumed what that meaning is. Um, we also have to consider that Paul is talking to an audience. And so the letter is going to, to people, right? So do they have some mystical, non-contextual understanding of the text as well? Like, why does Paul even cite the Old Testament if, he's, if he isn't trying to bridge their understanding with his? Hmm. So like his, they probably, um, his audience, know the text in its context. He's citing it for a reason. It's shared knowledge. Paul's using that knowledge to bring them along theologically. So if he radically departed from that original text that they held to be authoritative, then he wouldn't be persuading anyone, right? So if he was coming up with some novel thing and not based on this shared text and group of texts that they they held as authoritative, how could how could he then be bridging the gap? They would just go, "That's you're just not talking about the text anymore that that we we want to hold as authoritative. It's not persuasive." Does that make sense? Hmm. So basically, you're saying like, "Hey, these people that he's trying to convince, they already believe a specific." view about the bible they they understand the context and if paul is giving like this extra knowledge that is not part of the context they'd be like well that that that's not even what the text has to begin with so why, why would we care yeah it, it'd be it wouldn't be very persuasive i don't think if he's coming up with some brand new um thing that they they'd never heard really just divorcing it from its context he's using the text to lead them along that's the whole point mm -hmm. but this is did Paul's audience not know that he was writing inspired scripture? I don't know if that's, that's even a, a serious question. Was it a serious question? Yeah, I, I, yeah, that's 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 not at all apparent to me. I, I don't think. Um, yeah, so uh, I think he's trying to. It's a liter, It's a literal letter. This is an actual letter from a person to people, persons, Paul and others, probably writing with him, um, like Tertius and all that. Uh -huh. uh, and he's trying to persuade them because there's a problem, right? And so appealing to apostolic authority wouldn't be that helpful, I don't think. He's instead trying to actually lead them along. He could have just opened the letter and saying, I, Paul, am an apostle. You guys are being dumb. This is Do this. Yeah, but he doesn't. He's trying to lead them along. And so that you have to have this shared framework of, hey, we both like the Old Testament. We both hold this to be an authoritative text in some way. Uh, well, look at this. It actually says what I'm saying about mm -hmm. about Jesus and the gospel and what's happening. And so he's leading them that way. Mm. Yeah, it's really interesting. I appreciate that. Okay, so see if there's anything else worth mentioning that, that that pretty much gets all that stuff out of the way. Oh, yes. The the one thing we wanted to talk about. All right. So a, a big part in this in this whole discussion is this whole Jacob and Esau hating and loving situation here. Um, so I'm just going to read the text really quickly. So we have some context that we'll get into it. So uh, maybe I should put it on the screen here. That'd be cool. All right, we're gonna put it on the screen. Everybody gets an extra treat. All right. Uh, Joel, make a joke about something while I figure this out. Your outfit. I say that was a pretty good joke. <laughs> All right. So, uh, uh, yep, this is it. All right. So, it, um, so Romans 9, uh, 6. All right. So, we're getting to it. For it is not as though the word of God had failed for it. Not all those who are descended from Israel are truly saved, nor are all the children Abraham's true descendants. Rather, through Isaac will your descendants be counted. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God. Rather, the children of promise are counted as descendants. For this is what the promise declared. About a year from now, I will return and Sarah will have a son. Not only that, but when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our ancestor Isaac, even before they were born or had done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose and election would stand, not by works, but by his calling, it was said to her, the older will serve the younger, just as it is written, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. So a really big uh, conversation here that people have on this discussion is that this whole uh, Jacob and Esau is is talking about individual people. So uh, the obvious problem with that is that if you want to say that you yourself are saying that hey Jacob's in a meeting one sec. <laughs> Sorry. You're good. Um so 
uh, are you talking to your children and you say, I'm in a meeting? Uh, I'm not sure who it was. Oh, nice. All right. Uh, also, I appreciate that you consider me so serious to be called a meeting. That's awesome. All right. So anyways, uh, Jacob, I love Isai hated. So you're talking about this, is like talking about the lineage, the the outcomes in the future. Uh, but the the text, like in general, like it's been talking about the a bunch of individual individual people before, like Isaac, yeah. Rebecca, Abraham. Those are all individual specific people. And then you're saying out of the blue ball is saying, hey, Jacob and Esau, they're not individual people anymore. They're talking about you know, future lineages. So I mean, doesn't that go against what the context is Paul is talking about here? Well, yeah, I mean, he is referring to individuals in, in some of these texts. Like okay. Isaac is an individual. Jacob is an individual. Um, but again, what is he choosing for? Like, what is the choice? What is he talking about when it comes to the choice? He's talking about determining which, like that person, and then following their lineage will be the ones who, inherit the Abrahamic uh, promise and be the people group who God is doing this thing um, through. And so, the, yes, it is referring to individuals there. Uh, in the Malachi text, Jacob I love, but Esau I hated, it is it is referring to, to, to the nation because if you go to the context, it, it's talking about way further down the line. So he goes from the beginning in Genesis all the way to like the mm -hmm. end of the Old Testament, so to speak, to Malachi. And the point is that he maintained this relationship with Jacob for all that time. Jacob, he okay. loved, he kept this, this um, relationship. Um, and al although it did sway and he did, like I say, narrow it down to um, just the Southern two tribes, but he did maintain that and that covenantal relationship. And then he did not do so. Um, he did not have the Abrahamic blessing and, uh, uh, and promises come through uh, Esau and then ultimately Edom. And he didn't have that relationship of preservation with them and of um, that covenantal relationship, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, yes, it is talking about individuals, but it's then what is the the purpose of of this? Uh, um, what are they being chosen for? It's not for individual salvation; it's for this this lineage, um, and that's pretty. That's that's what the contexts are about. Um, yeah, and so I just think it's it's a misreading of what this text is 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 trying to say. Okay, all right. Um, so that um, we jumped ahead there. That's my fault. So. I guess we don't have to ask those other questions, uh, but that's fine. We can, we can keep going. Yeah, I don't have. I do, I only have about. Yeah, I don't. I don't. I don't have. Uh, I got about forty more minutes. Forty more minutes. Oh, that's a lot yeah. of time. All right. Okay. Well, in that case, let's go ahead and get to the the second part of this discussion, where you're kind of continuing your previous video here, and um, what was that talking about? The where does that start at? What verse do you want to go on to? Your call, my friend. No, no, you. <laughs> there were certain specific things you didn't get to talk about in the last video. Oh, I'm asking, uh oh, yeah. uh, oh, I, I see what you're saying. Uh, was that verse 22, 23? Uh, doesn't he like quote Isaiah? He does. Yeah, yeah. I'm just, oh. I'm just trying to follow the questions you want to ask me here. You're right. Okay. No, no. Go back. There's one other question I actually really did want to ask you about. All right. Yeah. So, um, so get to it sorry guys uh okay all right yeah let's this this will be good all right so after talking about how someone might think god is immoral for what he did in the previous verses paul in romans 9 20 says but who indeed are you a mere human being to talk back to god does what is molded say to the molder why have you made me like this and, and of course, many have interpreted this as saying something like, you know, we shouldn't question God for being in, immoral. If if God does say something, like if that's what the Bible says, if God says that, then we should just take it as it is. We should never question it, never question our interpretation about that. Um, what, are, what are your thoughts on that? Is that what Romans 9.20 is, is talking about? Uh, yeah, I don't think it's asking like an abstract philosophical question like that or something. Um, and I don't think it's... Uh, Paul responding to somebody or, or like voicing the the opinion of someone who um, is is predestined to damnation or something like that. I don't think that's what's going on. Um, it's not someone saying um, why is he so in fault? Who can resist his will? Like uh, I'm I'm damned and there's and like how's that fair that I'm damned? And like oh well, who are you to to answer back to God that you're damned? I don't think he's he's talking about that at all. Um, if you've been following what I've been saying, you could probably already see the through line here. 
uh, it's it's you can't skip if you're going to read that you can't skip the previous the previous verse this when you when you say uh who are you a mere mortal to talk back to god does what his molder said to the one who molded it have you made me like me like this we'll, we'll, we'll go back paul had just put a question in the opponent the interlocutor's mouth says you will say why does he still find fault for who can resist his will and then you have to go that go back from that that's a response to what what is what is that person responding to and i've been talking about this it's the idea that god sovereignly chooses to define his people as he sees fit and we see he's giving examples isaac jacob and then um also uh with pharaoh that he, if people kick up a kick against god uh he he can he can he can he will use them so um and they pharaoh is like i said kind of like a proxy for israel at the time or a sort of unbelieving Jews at the time, they have kicked against God and God has um, uh, made another decision to constitute in Christ. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're going to see that in the verses to come actually. Um, so I, I think that's actually a good point because he's about to cite Paul. So once he goes further here, he's going to cite um, the a verse that refers to the exile of the Northern 10 tribes mm -hmm. and that he only continues the promise with the Southern two tribes. That's the Isaiah passage that's coming up. He chooses to make this judicial decision based on the ten tribes' failures, and so in the same way, Israel is like Pharaoh, and that they kicked against, or sort of modern, uh, the, the present-day Jew, Jewish uh, people uh, or uh, unbelievers were were like Pharaoh in that way; they're kicking against, and just like in the past, when the ten tribes also um, were against God, he made this choice to limit what constitutes Israel um, and those who are continuing the Abrahamic promise. That's that's God's prerogative. He can choose the confines and the limits of the people who continue this Abrahamic mission. Um, Paul, he's he's, he's going to get there in these Isaiahic citations uh, and Hosea as well. Um, he's he's leading he's leading um, us there in the argument. He's slowly inferring that God has made another judicial decision to limit the seed group. Uh, the Abrahamic promise is now in Christ. Some biological Israelites slash Judeans or even converts to Judaism through works. Mm -hmm. uh, find themselves outside of that group now. The lump of clay, Israel, has been split again in two. These people fi suddenly find themselves opposed to God's purposes and to the Abrahamic promise. And they are, they are asking the question, how, how is it fair that God has made this new choice to continue his covenant in Christ? How, how am I on the outside now? How am I the bad guy here, right? Um, and you can see why why someone will be saying that when God makes this decision in Christ to a decision to redeem in this way that they didn't like and didn't work with the way that they were they were envisioning things yeah yeah okay all right so then the, the next verse right after this that we're talking about um so after it's saying like you know who who what kind of right do you have to say that kind of thing um it says has the potter no right to make from the same lump of clay one vessel for special use and another for ordinary use but what if god willing to demonstrate his wrath and to make known his power has endured with much patience the objects of wrath prepared for destruction and what if he is willing to make known the wealth of his glory on the objects objects of mercy that he has prepared beforehand for glory so a lot of people have interpreted these these few verses here to say that hey like you you can question you know you can question god whatever or, you know specifically you shouldn't though and not only that like you have no right but also specifically like it might seem immoral to you, but you know, God's doing this for his glory. Like this, this is his, his glory. His, that is his goal in all this. That's what's most important here. Uh, do you think this is the interpretation of the past? Like what, what is the, the whole meaning of this glory idea? Yeah. Um, I mean, just, you asked a few questions there. Uh, I think we could start with what are the vessels? Okay. Are we talking about individuals? Uh, are we talking about different groups made out of the same lump of clay? which is what I was getting at. Hmm. So you've got the potter, he's got Israel, and then he divides it. And now some are vessels of, of wrath and some are vessels of mercy. Um, this idea of vessels of wrath um, as people groups does actually that exact language comes from the Old Testament. Um, you can find it in Jeremiah 27, 25 in the Septuagint version, the these uh, skeve or gaze, vessels of wrath. It's the same thing that he uses here. So it's um, groups used in God's in per God's purposes of judgment. So I think it is uh, referring to this divided lump of Israel here. Okay. Uh, the point is that God has, has put up with various groups in the past who kick against him. So we've got Edom kicks against God in some ways. And so we, we see that Pharaoh in Egypt, 
and then the northern tribes, these people who kick against. Uh, and it's it's in order to accomplish his purposes uh, with the group that he's showing mercy to. So he'll use these groups as well. Um, an example would have been the southern two tribes at the past. At the time of Paul, it was the Jews and Gentiles in Christ whom he now gives this calling in Christ. So you've got um, vessels of mercy, those who he's continuing this Abrahamic promise with, which is in the past, it was the two tribes, that now it's Jews and Gen uh, Gentiles in Christ. These are the vessels of mercy. And then there have been a, other vessels of wrath in the past as well. Um, th th these vessels of mercy are prepared for, beforehand for glory. That's not saying that they are predestined individually, irrevocably, uh, since the foundation of the world for salvation, apart from like their own volition. It's not talking about that. Uh, Paul's saying that God prepares these vessels for glory. Um, he like he's as in he's like he's shining the pots up. Uh, he's getting them ready for glory. They are in the process of being put on a glorious display. Like oh. um, they're going to Antiques Roadshow, right? You're gonna really make them look. Is that, is that reference fall flat on you? Do you know what that is? Not really. I mean, I okay. Know what well, I'm is. old. Antiques Roadshow is like I don't know if anyone knows that, but just like the show where you bring your most valuable antiques and they'd make them look good, and you try and evaluate how much they're worth. Uh, it's from my own childhood. There Are you go. Are you talking about Pawn Stars? No, I'm not at all. I don't. I've heard of it. I don't know. I've never watched it. It's probably similar. It's probably the modernized version of it. You, you're so uncultured. That's okay. I actually am very much so. <laughs> all uh, right. So we could. So yeah. here, uh, another way we could actually do this. So if someone says, I don't like your interpretation of vessels of mercy and vessels of wrath being okay. um, people groups or groups, I think it's individuals. You can actually still talk about these groups individually, even though I do think it's people groups. So you could still have a first century Jew saying it's unfair that now that they're now in the out group and that God is putting up with them and it, an individual vessel of wrath who is headed for like prepped for throwing out like prep for destruction. I think that's what it means. Like, like um it's the image it's still the imagery of the pot right it's like it's a pot that has discontinued use the question is whether they are unalterably a vessel of wrath now that they are found in this position can they get out of that position and i would say yes um, by belief in christ paul uses a similar a similar analogy in uh, second timothy um so you can actually see like the same analogy where a, 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 a you could be a dishonorable pot to become an honorable pot and he says in second timothy 2 20 to 21 now in a great house, there are not only gold and silver vessels, um, same term, but also wooden and earthenware ones, some of which are for honorable use, some of which are for ordinary use. Therefore, if someone cleanses himself from these things, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. Mm -hmm. So even if it is individual, you could, like, the question is, um, if someone did find themselves, now I'm a vessel of wrath, now I'm in the position, I'm against God, let's say a first century Jew, now that God has chosen to constitute Israel in Christ. Okay, well then, how do you get out of that position? It's not irrevocable it's not predetermined in that sense you can just put faith in christ and now you're in the vessels of mercy category so it still works um individually in that sense mm -hmm. um so I, I i i think you could take it either way when you once you get to the vessels of, of of wrath and vessels of mercy but i do think that it's referring to the groups um it's he's talking about collective groups here yeah does that make sense yeah okay so just for some clarity here so it specifically says, what if he is willing to make known the wealth of his glory? So yeah. it seems clearly that God's glory is on focus here. But then it also said on the objects of mercy that he has prepared beforehand for glory. So is he saying that those objects are meant to glorify him? Or is he saying, or are you, how are you interpreting this? Are you interpreting it as that that glory is actually going to us? Is that a le legitimate way to interpret that? Uh, and I'm not quite sure if I'm understanding what you're asking. Uh, okay. Uh, well, it says for glory. So who's, who's, yeah, yeah. Who, who is the glory? Who's the glory going towards? I think, um, prepared beforehand f towards glory, like for the purpose of going towards glory in the sense of they are headed towards an eschatological reality of glory. Hmm. They're prepared okay. to go to that thing in the future. Mm -hmm. That's what I yeah. think. Does okay. that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean that that definitely mirrors uh, Isaiah like sixty one a lot. So I don't know if if there's any references there going on. Um, but yeah, let's let's talk about to the the, the next bit here. So um, was it twenty four and onwards? Is that what you wanted to start oh, yeah, off yeah. with? Yeah, yeah. 
we can we can even put it on the screen. Look at that technology. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. Did I uh, did you do you want me to read it or we're just gonna have it on the screen there? You can read it or I can take it off if you're not gonna talk about it. Up to you. No, I'll, I'll talk about it. Yeah. So Paul's done going on. He's going on now. He's gonna talk about okay. So Jews, not only Jews, has he um, brought into this reconstituted Israel? Oh, what happened there? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but also from the Gentiles, and so that's like a pretty radical thing when it comes to. Uh, the first century, like how are the Gentiles included in? And I got into this a bit in my video about um, the citation of Hosea here. It's really contested. How is he citing the Old Testament? Okay. Um, how is it working here? Uh, I like the, it's a more recent interpretation by Jason Staples when he talks about um, that the Northern tribes, because that's what this original context is in Hosea, the Northern tribes are going to be taken out. And, but he says he's going to bring them back. And so it's in essence that the northern tribes become the nations they become the gentiles and then um in paul's day now uh that in by the gentiles coming in uh it's showing the fulfillment of this prophecy because he is bringing back so to speak the northern tribes of israel um, f um by means of bringing in the gentiles um so it's almost like a narratival application he's looking at the history of israel that the 10 northern tribes were dispersed became the nations and now that the nations are coming in israel is coming back in the northern 10 tribes um, i like that idea there are different ways you could do this you could also think by like analogy like israel was basically not his people and then we made made his people and in the same way the gentiles were not his people but now made his people you could do like an analogy or something like that yeah. but I, I think that that's that's what's going on so he's trying to prove now and say like why is it that the gentiles are being brought in why is it that the gentiles are part of this and he's he's giving a, a proof text in that sense um which is effective because he's trying to demonstrate that this is the way that god works that god that this is something that's expected from from the prophets um i think the next citation as well if we move to isaiah it says isaiah cries out concerning israel when it comes to that passage um he's citing isaiah 10 22 to 23 and I think you're supposed to think again about the past. So if you want to, I'm not sure if the whole, can the audience see the verse there? Or what verse are we talking about? Isaiah? Or... Uh, Isaiah. Yeah. If you move down to 20, uh, oh, okay. 27. Gotcha. Yeah. There. Yeah. And so Isaiah cries out on behalf of Israel. I don't think you should jump to when you're reading this, that Isaiah as to understanding this as Isaiah cries out concerning the Jews in Paul's day like Israel being equated necessarily with Jews and Paul's day. I don't think that's what's going on. I think he's pointing back to the time of the 12 tribes. This text that he's citing is about the incoming Assyrian exile. This is when God is going to limit who the seed is again in judgment, right? He's going to say 10 tribes are out. Now it's the Southern two. This is the seed. Um, so th when it says that he's got the remnant will be saved, it's saying that Israel has become narrowed down the seed is now a remnant israel's become this not this it's now this um and so god has then made that divine choice the prerogative to not have mercy in a sense um and to only have mercy on a smaller group so i'll have mercy on whom i have mercy compassion on whom i have compassion he has chosen i'm working with these not with those they have rebelled too much they're up um and so again it's this limiting of who what constitutes israel um now, by, by way of application and implication, this is the same thing that's happening again at the time of Paul, right? That's what I've been arguing this whole time. It's that he's made another um, choice to constitute Israel in Christ. And uh, the remnant, so to speak, is now in Christ. That's what constitutes Israel. And judgment has occurred um, to unbelieving um, Jews. And uh, you could, yeah, at the time. Um, Israel still ex uh, Israel biologically ethnically still does exist but it's it's in Christ so Paul is he'll say I'm a Jew like I'm an Israelite I am from the seed of Abraham like he like that's that 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 still stands to the to, to the to the ethnic people mm -hmm. of the Jews at the time um but it's uh, this idea of the Abrahamic promise the seed has continued now through this remnant that is uh those who are trusting in Christ of his of, of his uh, descent and lineage and Gentiles are now brought into that as well. They're grafted into that. 
Uh, we also see in the, the next uh, citation as well. So in Romans 9, 29 there, you've got Isaiah 1, 9. It's saying something similar. Uh, the seed theme pops up again. So if the Lord of, uh, you have the translation here, the Lord of heaven's armies had not left us descendants. The word is seed again. Hmm. Um, some translations like that say descendants. He's still continuing the seed argument. God limits what people are continuing, the Abrahamic promise. He limits who the seed is. And that then leads you to verses 30 to 32. Like, what shall we say? That the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness attained righteousness, even the righteousness that is by faith. But Israel, pursuing the law of righteousness, did not attain to the law. Like, why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as if by works. So the point is that Israel, and I think here Paul is talking about the broad scope, like, let's look at the history of Israel. Israel is a whole entity, looking up and down the passage of time. They didn't get righteousness. They didn't get this eschatological righteousness in Christ, this, this kind of thing that, that, that it was all leading towards. But Gentiles ended up getting it which is like a total shocker to the first century Jews. Gentiles did what Israel or get, got what Israel was supposed to get. And they, and they did it by exercising faith uh, in God. So, so note, note here again, we've got Gentiles, we've got Israel, we've got people groups. And he explicitly says that the reason that the Gentiles are vessels in this vessels of mercy category is because they exercise faith, right? It's, it's, it's they are, they pursued it by faith. Uh, so faith is the prerequisite for getting into that group in this text. It's, it's not works that is we're like relying on ancestry or legalism or through guarantees, um, hmm. but it's uh, that doesn't get you a spot in the Abrahamic blessing. It's it's by faith, hmm. and so that's 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 really like you could see here that he is talking about that the faith is what gets you in or out of these groups, um, but sometimes people miss that when they they they, they skip over. Um, this part where they get really stuck in the earlier parts of the chapter. But uh, he's really making an, an historical argument that from the beginning of Israel's history, it's not about, it's always been about God's choice of what constitutes the seed group and that he can limit it if he chooses to, like he did right here, it's short, citing the Isaiah passages. Um, and he can even bring back in the Northern tribes through the Gentiles, perhaps that's how he's using Hosea. Uh, and, but it, again, that's, God's choice to do those things. So it is about God's sovereign choice in that way, but it's not about God's sovereign choice in choosing you particularly before the foundation of the world to damnation or glory. That's that's not what he's talking about. That's not the Old Testament context. Um, I do realize that the interpretation I'm taking uh, could be uh, labeled as kind of, uh, some people might say, oh, it's kind of like light supersessionism or something like that. Like, oh, you've, you've done away with, with, with Israel or something like that. Uh, I, I wouldn't want to to, to be a, labeled a supersessionist or something like that. Uh, uh, John Golden Gay, uh, I was reading him recently. He, he, I like this quote that he that he he has. It's, he said that it is not ethnicity alone that defines Israel. The norm is ethnicity plus commitment. If there is commitment, a shortcoming in ethnicity can be overcome, but the right ethnicity cannot overcome the absence of commitment. And so I think that that's the idea going on here is that. Paul does that God doesn't work with ethnicity alone. He can limit the group based on his choice, um, uh, whether or not they're 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 working with him or not working with him. Whether they're maintaining their the Abrahamic blessing and promises, they're they're being a light to the nation. Are they doing that? Are they blessing the world? Are they being priests to the nations? Um, and so we we see that he's made another choice at the time of uh, Paul and in the first century in Jesus, and that's what Paul is trying to argue here. He's trying to use the Old Testament to show. This makes sense given on the patterns of the past of God, how, how God has worked. And yes, okay, present day um, kinsmen according to the flesh, his biological kinsmen aren't believing, but we shouldn't define Israel as though it's just about ethnicity. It's about who are the people of the Abrahamic promise, who are keeping this going. And now it's being defined in Christ. And so um, with ethnic Jews believing, um, for sure, Paul is one of them. And that's really the, the thrust of the argument of what's going on here. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So um, someone did have a question. Uh, would this be considered replacement theology? I don't know um, how much you know about that. I don't know much at all. Um, yeah. So uh, I, that, I was what I was saying with supersessionism, like the idea of like replacing. I don't think it's replacing because it's still, and, and I know people could bring charges against that. And I, I understand that. Um, I think it's still, it's Paul is still talking about, ethnic Jews in the sense that he is one who is like he is and there are others and now 
Israel, this like prophetic entity, this thing that keeps this whole mm -hmm. story of Abraham's promise and of what God is doing with Israel to be a light to the nations, like like that is continuing in Christ now. But there's there are ethnic Jews in that, so it's still ethnic in that sense. And then the Gentiles are being grafted onto that. Um, but I do recognize them that would leave other groups out. I and I mean even in like uh, Staples' own work, um, Jason Staples, who I refer to, like he, yep. he, he does say like yeah, people will probably say this, there's some sort of supersessionism or something like that that could be implied. Um, I, I don't think that that's completely fair. I mean, if God chose to limit the people in the past, all biological Israelites in the time of the Assyrian exile, like that's 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 in the Old Testament as well. So this is a pattern in the in it. It's just a matter of uh, how we want to parse these terms um, and these labels. So I don't. Yeah, maybe uh, I understand why that charge is is labeled, but I'm I I push a little bit against it. Well, I mean, didn't even in the Old Testament there were there many times where another people group or of the people of another nation an immigrant could come in and you know worship yahweh and considered part of the group right mm -hmm. yeah for sure yeah. yeah totally um so um uh, the other thing that i want to talk about is um and i don't mm -hmm. understand the full arguments maybe i'm um, looking silly now in that case but uh, there's there's a number of different people. I think Leighton Flowers mentioned it that like like this last part is evidence against the the, the Calvinist interpretation from the first, the the before passages. Um, do you think that is a good argument to make? If if that's how you understand it, or or what do you think there? Yeah, I think I already touched on that. In that, yeah, it's talking about faith specifically. Yeah, it's not about it's not talking about he's not talking about predestination or anything. Like that. He's saying that. Um, they pursued it by by works, by depending on lineage, by depending on this or that aspect of the law as making them in the right and assuming that they're, that they're in the right with God because of it, or they're, they're, they're continuing this uh, to be the, the, the continuers of, of the Abrahamic promise. But really, it was, no, you have to pursue this by faith, by allegiance to God. And so, um, yeah, easy, that definitely, that faith comes in here is showing that faith has been, um, or that Paul assumes faith. Um, to get into the the category of of vessels of mercy. Okay. All right. And, yeah. So that I mean that that concludes pretty much all my questions. Do you have any ever thoughts you wanted to add to the video? Uh, not really. No. I mean, uh, if you if you want more in depth, uh, go to the video that I that I put out because I did kind of really go into some of these Old Testament citations. Uh, yeah, I, I think this is something that we can all just talk about. We can dialogue about. It's okay to have different opinions. It's okay to have different interpretations. Sure. And it's just really a matter of, um, okay, let's dialogue. Let's try and get at what this text was getting at, what Paul was getting at. And, um, yeah, let's not fight each other here. Let's seek understanding together um, from various camps. That's always the most important thing. Awesome. All right. Well, much appreciated. Yeah, obviously, everybody <laughs> subscribe to Dr. Koretko's YouTube channel. And so he could become famous and um i do appreciate you coming on here it's been fun um uh we'll we'll be doing ephesians in the future ephesians one and, and other passages in regards to the whole soteriology and calvinism discussion as well as uh, we're going to talk about ezekiel and yeah what is that leviticus or or uh, exodus 22 yeah yeah, talk about child sacrifice. Is that what the biblical text was teaching? Obviously, Joel would say no. But whoa, we'll interesting. That. that you interesting. You assume, did you know? Did you know my opinion? Well, you've talked about it before. I don't know if I've assumed that or not. Maybe I'm wrong. Find out. I I, I will find out myself soon. <laughs> I'm just I'm just playing with you. Yeah, I, I I don't think those interpretations make the most sense of those texts, but uh -huh. we'd have to really walk through them. Yeah. yeah, we'll we'll get to that later. So this this will not be the first time or the last time that he will be on here. But all right, it's been fun. I, I hope you have a good time at whatever you're doing, your kid's baseball game or whatever. I hope yeah, he does the yeah, best. Do. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, I'll, I'll see you later, man. All right. See ya.